If you're talking about the kind of Scotland people want to see, mm. and you mentioned there of the, the Nordics, the welfare yeah. system yeah. is hugely enviable. Um, and it's a different conception of welfare. Um, it was put very well by a, a professor that came over recently, mm. Jonkvist, who said, um, you know, welfare is not just redistributing between different people, but across your own lifetime. There will be times where you pay in when you're economically active and times where you take out, but it's there for you across your life. And to that degree, it's not there just for the poor, as it were. It's there to help right. you in your life. It's like a state insurance policy, as it should yeah. be. Yeah. Um, can you really see any way with the current government in Westminster of, of getting anywhere closer to that sort of vision of welfare in any way except having an independent Scotland? No. Uh, to, be, to, to be blunt about it. I mean, right, that's the headline, everyone. We can go now. <laughs> but, but, but the interesting point about that is that if you talk about the current coalition at Westminster and, you know, the Lib Dems will have to answer to someone sometime, um, you know, uh, a lot of the politics are completely crazy. They're, they're quite alien to what I believe. And in, in fact, the, the, uh, as I described, the Tea Party Tories are very similar to the Tea Party and the Republicans have got, and, and they got thumped by Obama, thankfully, but they're not learning that lesson. But coming to the welfare issue, I mean, welfare, if you listen to the coalition, is becoming a devalued concept. And if you're on welfare, you're a scrounger, you're a skimper, you're lazy. And, and of course, the biggest problem with poverty is it's those in work that are experiencing poverty um, to a much larger extent than those who are actually claiming benefits. But that takes Labour forward to the point where, if indeed Scotland became independent, will Labour not fight the elections? Will the Tories mm. not fight the elections? Will we just say, well, I'm sorry, we'll take the ball, we'll go off the field because we lost? Of course not. And one of the things that I'm trying to say is at least a fallback position. If for any reason there is a vote for independence, then Labour will have to plan for the possibility that they might want to run Scotland if they can provide a viable opposition to the SNP. And the other problem then is, do the SNP decide that their mission is over, or do they become a large-end nationalist party, which to me creates some concerns in my own mind. So there's a huge future on welfare and on every other issue, but simply just now, the Labour Party does not get it. And the danger is that, if there's an, I think if there's an independence vote tomorrow, my prediction, which is not worth much, uh, would be something like 65, 35, it would not pass. If we carry on as we are, the danger of the unionist run is that, that I think that's the high watermark for the unionist vote. So over the next nearly two years, that could narrow to the 50s and 40s um, because of the sheer weight and the sheer campaign strength and might, what might happen to the coalition. So I think there's a lot of um, dangerous activity around for the unionists but they're showing no signs of urgency, no signs other than to say, look, we've been together since 1707, trust us. And if I could just make a point which interests me, 16 and 17 year olds are going to be able to vote in this. Now, there's not enough of them in every constituency to swing a vote. But you know, the other big issue is if you take the group um, that are under 24, the bulk of their thinking period from say 10 years of age onward has been focused on the Scottish Parliament. I mean, I've got a grandson who's going to be, he's going to miss the vote in October by something like three weeks. Now, he's existed with the Scottish Parliament. He might not even know where Westminster is. And I think we ignore at our peril the generational change that's taking place. So everybody from 16, 17 to 24 will actually be only conscious of Scottish Parliament powers debate, and Westminster is a bit far gone. So to underestimate that size of cohort would be quite dangerous. So I think these are one of the other issues that concern me, and again should be a stimulus for the Unionist Party to say, hang on a minute, you know, I think we've got a challenge on our hand, but currently they don't see it like that. I'm still reeling from the notion that any grandson of yours wouldn't know what Westminster was. <laughs> well, I was trying to use it as an illustration rather than as a real example. But just two, two other thoughts, and then let's hear what the audience thinks. Um, the, the, Joanne Lamont's something for nothing speech, um, which is, you know, the fact I can even sum a whole speech up in one phrase is possibly telling. She must have known how, yeah, how fractious that, that statement would be. Mm -hmm. And it did come around the time of the Labour Party conference back to dear Ed Miliband. Is she on orders? Well, I mean, I, uh, I have a great respect for Joanne, um, but, uh, and I'm not willing to blame her advisors, but that was um, 
a thoroughly misplaced uh, contribution to, to any debate. And I had to respond by saying I just simply didn't agree because, you know, as one of the people that um, was involved in putting free personal care through, I mean, it's not free, I mean, it's paid for by the taxpayers, but it's, it's free at the point of need. But so is the National Health Service. So you can't say that that's something for nothing because essentially you pay for it and the political priority is to provide it, and that's the essence of politics. And then we went on about um, the uh, tuition fees, then we went on about the, uh, the free, uh, free this and free that. Um, no, it was, it was ill-timed, um, and it didn't reflect the realities, because if Labour means anything, it's got to be about a progressive, in my view, left of centre party that still values uh, fairness, justice. And when you look at uh, the whole care issue, which I think was one of the things that she majored on, you know, in England we had this scandal of virtually selling your granny, where old folks' homes were being sold off for a property value, and then we had to move some thousands and thousands of people. Now, one of the professors at Harvard made the point and said, you know, it's okay to have a market economy, but do you want a market society? You know, where we don't know the value of anything, but we know the cost of everything. And it's just a nonsense. So if Labour can't get that basic point, and you know, let me just finish on this point about that. I feel passionate in the sense that people say, well, we can't afford it. You are a rich country. Scotland's a rich country. Britain's a rich country. But at the end of the day, politics should be at priorities. And if we look, want to look after older people in a way which has the dignity that we think they should have, why should we afford it? And the other thing, of course, was part of that speech, and part of the, the, the I think politicians are frightened to talk about it. You never hear anybody talk about, and I know you'll go, oh, no, about raising taxes. Mm. You know, the Scandinavians have really, through democracy and through ballot boxes, have great services, and people vote for them. And the fairness there is that you, you actually have people contributing to the tax burden, not on the basis of how poor they are and get thumped, but actually how rich you are and how wealthy you might be, and you make a bigger contribution to it. So that, again, was part of the speech that I would have made because at the end of the day, we need a debate on fairness in, in Scotland as well as the UK, and we're not getting it. And so, just the final thought, when we come, you're, you're, you're envisaging a situation beyond 2014, but let's just come mm -hmm. back to just before mm -hmm. the referendum. Will all sorts of um, rabbits be removed from hats? I mean, will the unionists, because currently we have this ludicrous situation mm -hmm. where David Cameron, and one must Im imagine Ed Miliband as well, is basically saying, show us you want more devolution, by voting no. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the logical nonsense we're in at the moment. Will there be something suddenly drawn from the hat by everybody? Joanne Lamont's got her commission, Ming Campbell's reported mm -hmm. already, David Cameron makes rumbling noises. I've just come back from Iceland, a volcano comes to mind. Um, will something emerge so that there will be at the last minutes a spoiler? You started off by asking me, you know, in terms of the unions, will they learn the lesson? And I said, well, I hoped but I feared they wouldn't. I think that's the same, same reply. Um, Would it uh, make sense to have effectively well, a spoiler, let me, let me, if you I mean, like? Part, part of the book is about saying that if you reject the second question, and the second question was important because you would have decided. In a referendum, the public decide. It's a plebiscite on an issue. But by removing it, what the unionists are really offering and saying, look, trust us. You vote it down, and we'll deliver more devolution. But Henry, supposing, I mean, that's where we are at the moment, right. and it's a formless no, trust. No, no, but that's what I'm, I'm going to just explain. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my expression saying, well, no, we don't trust you, right? But what can they do then? And here's the, here's the problem. The run-up to 2014, the Labour Party wants to report on their research in 2014. It's too late. We could have a worked-up option tomorrow, virtually. I think it will be the same with other parties. But if you then get to 2015, and a coalition of some sort again is established with the Tories leading it, or even a Labour government, what can they do in 2015 after a vote's rejected independence in 2014? Uh, so therefore, I think the timescale is ludicrous. And the other thing, of course, is 2016, you'll then have elections to Holyrood. So in all that uncertainty, all that period ahead of us, the unions are going to offer you and say, well, look, please vote this down and we're with you. That's why it was so important to have the second question, now not available. That's why between now and um, October 2014, the Labour Party in particular has to offer a well-developed alternative. But you know the tragedy of that is? They can't promise to deliver it because they don't know whether they'll be in power at Westminster 
or indeed at Holyrood. And that just reinforces the point that if you trust the public, then give them the second question. And I think when Cameron and Co decided that wasn't on and Salmon was forced to have the one question, then we're ending up in a really difficult situation. But one thing is clear. Win or lose for independence in 2014, the face of Scottish politics will continue to change whether Westminster likes it or not. I would rather have it by consent, but if not, you, uh, I think Alex Salmon, don't think he's not sitting there with plan B. I mean, if anything, Alex Salmon's a realist. Independence goes down. You can bet your bottom dollar that in 2016 going to the polls, he may have the Devo Max alternative waiting, ready to go forward. And what happens once again, the unionist parties are trailing in the wake of the SNP. Now, as a Labour supporter, I don't find that much fun. But on the other hand, you've got to give it to Salmond. He's clever, adroit, he's charismatic, his leadership is obviously there whether you love him or hate him, and that matters in politics. If that is a scenario, we could get to 2016 with Alex p managing to, to kind of be the proposer, if you like, and the proponent of Devo mm -hmm. Max or Devo Plus, and then perhaps an automatic pushback because it has to be that way from the unionist parties because they can never agree to anything yeah. Alex proposes. So we have yet another four or five years of wrangling over the constitution. Correct. Which will mean in total we've had 10 years. Well, and you may, you may go to 2020. I mean, and, and the problem then is become we have got huge... More books, more books. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, if I made any money out of them, I would write I more books, but we don't. So that's not a consideration. But the main point is, yes, and there are so many big issues that we need to tackle. Um, but on the other hand, if, 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 if the unionist parties had the vision to realise that devolution is not going to go away, I mean, there are some people who think, you know, if you just put your hands over your head, um, stop listening, it'll go away. It won't go away. And that's why I think the danger is that Simon could have the Trump card, because currently the unions are saying, we not only want to defeat independence, but we want to destroy Simon. Now, the public don't buy that language. You know, the public are beyond personality politics. And as I said, whether you love him or hate him, you know, he's in power by a thumping majority. And if you look at other countries in Europe, where they have sub-national governments. You find that in Madrid, the Catalonians, for example, will send socialists to Madrid, but in, but, but in Catalonia, it's a mixture of nationalists. Now, you may then get to a point where the nationalists stay here forever. God forbid. But these are the realities that the unionist parties are not facing up to.